Excellent. Um, hello to everybody. Welcome to History Matters. And so does coffee. Um, today we're going to be talking about, um, I titled it Wrestling with the Founders, and I'll explain that momentarily. Um, but before I do that, I will turn to my partner in crime, Annie, uh, who will offer the rules of the game. I will say before I do that, that what is happening in another room, so Annie is at Monticello, and in another room at Monticello, there's a meetup of people from the History Matters community. How many roughly would you say, Annie? Well, a few might have come since I came, but I think we're between 10 and 12 people there. 10 and 12 History Matters people. Someone's going to have to take a picture, man. I, I, need to, I need to see this. But anyway, I love the fact that, that this is happening. 500 people. Thank you, Carolee. OK, Annie, rules of the game. So we do not have 500 people, but we have some lovely people. <laughs> Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Evans. I'm the Director of Education Outreach at New American History, and I'm delighted to be here at Monticello with all of our History Matters friends uh, and those of you who are far and away in the chat. Uh, you will be engaging in the chat, and we encourage that. We love that. But if you have specific questions, as Joanne's talking this morning, you got to put them in the Q&A. We never get to all of them. We do the best we can. Um, and I also sometimes combine questions, but put as many as you can think of in the chat and we will answer as many as we can about halfway through. So uh, we're real excited to be here live today from Monticello and to hear uh, more about this week's topic. Excellent. Okay, thank you, Annie. Um, so I know um, it would be an understatement, right? To say like, I think I've talked about the founders before. Clearly I have. Um, and I didn't go back and look at the um, 117 other episodes <laughs> to see which ones were founder focused. Um, but I know there was at least one along the lines of this one, but um, I'm going to do something a little bit different today. Um, I, I wanted, partly I'm doing this because we have a History Matters meetup happening right now at Monticello, which is kind of remarkable. So there we are, Thomas Jefferson land. I thought this is a good reason for us to talk about the founders and to talk about Jefferson while people are sitting there. Um, and I guess also because uh, we've had a number of prominent um, examples, perhaps coming from the Supreme Court, uh, of bad history, of, of people making the past into um, what they need it to be, uh, for whatever it is that they want to do. Uh, and the founders, you know, they they often fall subject to that. And there's been a lot of, I've seen a lot of passing by my eyes um, on social media and elsewhere. Um, people now uh, probably encouraged by everything else, making all kinds of wild claims um, about the, the founders. Um, the, the one that I've now seen more than once is uh, that the founders did not believe in the separation of church and state. I bet that's a surprise to all of you. Um, I, I saw that in Florida teaching materials, and I saw some prominent Republicans claiming that on Twitter. That's not true. Um, but if you cherry pick quotes and you want it to be true and you need it to be true, it becomes true. So um, we deal with the founders in different ways. Um, I put wrestling because, as I'm going to make clear in my comments, that's what we ought to be doing, right? We, sh we shouldn't be bowing down to them. We shouldn't be adoring them. We shouldn't be putting them up on pedestals. Um, and I know I've talked about that before. Um, for all a bunch of reasons, some of which I'll talk about today, um, that not only does a disservice to the past, but it totally warps our understanding of the present and our ability to understand where we started and where we are now and what the connections are. Even just the, the phrase, the founders, and I know I've talked about this before. Um, if you claim the founders thought, you are asserting in a general sort of way that there is one solid founder blob and that they all agreed. And you could say in a general sort of a sense that there were probably general ideas that the founders uh, believed in, you know, rule of law. Um, but to make wild and constant claims about what the founders thought, you know, as a historian, any historian is like, mm -hmm. <laughs> I can think of 
18 million examples of different founders thinking different things. Um, but you have to be careful. Let me put it this way. I won't say that you should never say the founders, but if you're doing it, you need to be doing it in, in a responsible founder-esque way. Because among other things, if you just talk about the founders, you're essentially talking about a small group of men uh, in a small group of rooms, uh, thinking great thoughts, right? Standing on their pedestals. And even if you're just focused on the revolution, the revolution was a popular revolution grounded on the public and the government that arose roughly a decade later um, based on the United States winning the revolution, what was striking and different about the government was that it was grounded on public opinion. It was grounded on the public. So focusing only on the founders, um, it, another way in which it warps everything, right? It suggests that somehow or another a group of 10 elite men did everything when they couldn't have done anything if the American people hadn't been there in front forging the way. So for all of those reasons, um, it's not useful to talk about the founders as a blob. I, I will also repeat something that I just put out on Twitter. I said, imagine many years from now, looking back to the moment that we're in and looking only at presidents and a handful of high level people in office, looking only at policy and ideals, and then claiming that you understand the history of this period not going to work, right? Impossible. I mean, that that's beyond warped. You can't understand a time period by doing that. And you create a fantasy by doing so. And for some people, that fantasy becomes very important explicitly because they want it to be true in the present. So the founders, for any number of reasons, get, get warped and used and misused because a lot of people have a lot of things riding on shiny, perfect founders. Um, and I know um, that I have talked before about, and I'm not gonna remember when or how, um, I know I've talked about uh, John Adams. The, the, he has a wonderful series of quotes in his old age from people who are uh, writing letters to him, strangers writing letters to him and essentially saying, tell us about the declaration, tell us about the revolution with a, a sort of, adoring tone, right? They're already on their way to be the founders. Um, and he says in several letters, again and again, we weren't perfect. We didn't know what we were doing. I think I've quoted this before, right? He says, I watched people sign the Declaration of Independence, and there were a lot of people who were not happy at doing it. You could see it on their face, right? That was not a glorious, you know, the chorus in the background, they, you know, and then American history was made. That was a ground level moment. It was a, it was an auspicious, I suppose you could say moment, but it was a flawed moment and a human moment too. So all of that is important, particularly when dealing with the founding, because the reason people tend to make such often strange or big sweeping claims about the founders is they become the basis of the now. Um, people use them as the basis of the now. You know, if you have a founder that you can say, look, he, he, always he, supports me, I must be right. I, I once, uh, when I gave the job talk that I gave to um, get my job at Yale, I, I made a quote. I said something, oh no, I made a, an assertion. And someone in the, and it was a kind of radical assertion. And someone in the audience, another faculty member said, really? Like, is that really true? And I said, well, actually George Washington said in 1793. And I thought to myself, you got a founder you can quote, you kind of win the argument. So anyway, that's true on all sides uh, uh, of politics. So the founding isn't perfect, the founding isn't ideal. Um, and Thomas Jefferson in some ways is a perfect example of this phenomenon, right? In some ways, and I've referred to him this way I don't know if I'd done that on History Matters, but certainly out in the world. Um, I've referred to him as, in a sense, the poet of the revolution, the person who provided words, uh, seemingly aspirational words, inspiring words, the Declaration of Independence for um, what Americans wanted to believe themselves to be, right? And even from the distance of time, 
we look at the declaration as um, an important and in many ways, um, it's an iconic document, an inspiring document, right? So in that sense, he's the wordsmith or certainly maybe along with Tom Paine, but he, as far as the guy at the center, he's the person providing those kinds of words. And obviously he's also a slaveholder. He slept with an enslaved woman. We don't know under, you know, what circumstances. I'm not gonna go into that, into the Hemings issue, but we do know he had children by Sally Hemings. And regardless of their relationship, that was a power dynamic. He owned her. So whatever their relationship was, you can't deny that component of the relationship. Um, so the wordsmith, the guy with the inspiring words, the slaveholder uh, and sleeping with a slave. Um, I've dealt with Jefferson in the past as a politician and there are uh, any number of also similar kinds of um, contradictions or quirks or things that, that don't seem uh, particularly admirable, right? Uh, he, I would say he's a good politician and you'll, I'll explain that in a moment. He's a good politician because he was good at delegating responsibility and making it seem as though he wasn't doing anything to get things done, right? He would order Madison out into the world. He was really good at getting things done and yet staying away from conflict, not putting himself out front and center, you know, Hamilton is Mr. Front and Center. And, you know, Hamilton was an aggressive politician, but in some ways was not a good politician for that reason. So for example, you know, Jefferson really, really, truly didn't like confrontation. He did a lot of things uh, to avoid it. For example, when he's president, and this is clever, right? He would, as a matter of fact, I have occasionally done this uh, when I have something that I'm gonna propose uh, say to the history department and I'll meet individually with people before the meeting, right? So I can kind of get everyone in agreement and then you go have the meeting and everyone's like, I agree. That's what he would do, right? He would meet with individual cabinet members, hash out whatever was happening, essentially get them all in agreement. And then there would be a cabinet meeting and everyone would agree, you know? So, so for Jefferson, aces, you know, it, it worked really well. He was very skilled at that sort of thing. Um, another great example of him getting something done, but standing in the background. And I love this one only because it's, I guess it's not quite a pyramid scheme, but uh, it's in that realm. There's a, in the early years of Washington's administration. So basically the Gazette of the United States, which is the Federalist newspaper is the only one for a little while trying to be a national newspaper and Jefferson and Madison among others say, no, we need another newspaper that's not just preaching the glories of what the administration's doing. We need another newspaper with another point of view. So they create ultimately the National Gazette, um, but they have to get people to subscribe to the National Gazette, right? So they they take Freneau, Philip Freneau, they bring him to Philadelphia. They Jefferson gives him a job as a translator for the State Department, you know, Madison, they're, they're all helping. They're, they're not doing it in like, look at us, we're setting up a newspaper. They're quietly doing it, but they're setting it up so that's gonna happen, but then you have to get subscribers. So Jefferson, and I can't, I didn't look it up, so I'm not gonna be able to say to who or the, the right, the precise number, but there essentially is a letter, at least one, that he writes to someone in Virginia and he says something like, you know, if you get, 12 people to subscribe to the National Gazette, your subscription is free. <laughs> I just love it. It's, it's, it, it's weirdly, I mean, it makes sense, right? But it's weirdly modern sounding and it's also clever, right? I mean, it's, it's, there he is. You know, I don't think necessarily anyone at the time would trace him back to that. Maybe the, the guy trying to peddle subscriptions, but that's pretty effective politicking. You know, there's also Jefferson, the guy who says to Madison, cut Hamilton to pieces in the face of the public, which is almost a direct quote. To pieces in the face of the public is a direct quote. Um, in all of these ways, as a politician, he looks very detached and um, civil and not engaging in the ground level nastiness, but in some way or another, he is engaged in that nastiness. It's just in a way that he has framed it so that he doesn't appear to have been and probably so that he can feel himself that he's not sort of duking it out on the ground with people even though he's framing that. Um, a great 
example of that um, is, uh, went right out of my head just that second. Um, oh, I know, okay, uh, it's from a diary. A great example of that is uh, from his presidency. I don't know if I've used this anecdote before, but probably not, well, not more than once. It's a problem with doing 118 episodes. Um, a, a fellow named William Plumer from New Hampshire decided that he wanted to write the first history of the new American government, you know, like 1802, three, four, uh, I think Jefferson's first term. And he, you know, he does what one could do at the time. He, he goes from person to person, founder to founder and asks them questions and takes notes, right? So this is, it's gonna be the first history of the founding. He's talking to the founders uh, and literally asking the questions, I'm sure that many of us would love to ask, Plumer's doing it and his, um, some of his notes and his diaries and such are, are on microfilm and preserve, which is where I saw this. And he talks about, he writes a letter, he interviews Jefferson, talks to Jefferson, interviews him, asks a lot of questions. And then he goes to visit John Quincy Adams. And in the course of talking with him and interviewing John Quincy Adams, Plumer says, the weirdest thing happened when I was talking to Jefferson and asking him questions about his political past. He said it was, it was like his, his face, the expressions on his face kept changing, right? He, first he looked flattered and then he looked worried and then he looked unsettled and then he looked angry and then he looked flattered again. So Plumer is describing this sort of weird mix of emotions that he could detect on Jefferson's face. And John Quincy Adams says, oh, you were watching him wrestle with his political career, which is really <laughs> interesting, right? You were watching him think back to what he did politically as a politician and decide what he felt about it. That's, that's a quite a remarkable, which is why I remember it's a great story. Um, but it's along the lines of what I'm saying now. Um, so it, it's not that uh, I'm not here claiming necessarily that he was worse than everyone else. Certainly not that he was better than everyone else. Um, it, it's just, we look and see the words and we see the deeds, um, what he framed as these goals and accomplishments and, and you know, high flying thoughts um, that he didn't necessarily follow through on himself. And that's a pretty big gap. So he gets blame, but the fact of the matter is any slaveholder preaching about, <laughs> we just said B to B to B to B, thank you, Newby. Um, any slaveholder who is prominent in the revolutionary effort or is you know sort of out there uh, talking about freedom and liberty for Americans is has the same, distance between words and deeds. It's just Jefferson's is particularly dramatic. Um, so we need to wrestle with the real founders. Um, I'm gonna come back to that in a moment. We also need to think about who we mean when we say founders. Uh, a while back, there was a, oh, a long while back, there was a conversation on Twitter, a bunch of early American historians uh, and someone said, you know, well, so, okay, who do we think the founders are and who gets cut out of the list? And what does that mean? You know, how is, and it became a real discussion, right? And, and these are early American historians. And some of them were saying, you know, and this was long enough ago, this is pre Hamilton musical, long enough ago that, you know, for much of the time I've been writing about Hamilton, he was kind of not considered a founder. He was kind of slightly on the side. I used to give um, lectures, I'm sure some are preserved on my computer that say things like, um, you know, the founders are all in this room together and Hamilton's banging on the door. He was not quite included in the, in the founder circle. Um, but in this conversation, you know, people were talking about, well, do we, do we actually want to use framers? That's a better word, people who framed the constitution. There's actually a way in which there's a reality factor there. Like that's a good word. It's different from founders though. Founders is broader and can have a lot of different meanings. And who do we include? You know, what, what, what do you do to become a founder? Now you could say, okay, um, play a prominent role in founding documents, right? The declaration, the constitution, the articles of confederation. Um, one might also argue, do some kind of prominent early American shaping act that has a longstanding influence, right? I mean, I, 
and we can have this conversation uh, after I'm done with my comments here, but how might one define founders? Uh, a person who I thought of off the cuff, um, and I don't know how many of you know of uh, Richard Allen, uh, who's a Philadelphian um, and uh, African-American black man um, who founded uh, the first independent black denomination in the United States, founded the African Methodist Episcopal Church, um, which in and of itself is significant, but he also was very prominent in stepping forward and standing up for the black community, um, any other number of things. He was a, a voice that was taking part in debate. Uh, he was making strong claims that went against the popular flow. He, he wrote, I almost in the past, I've almost uh, I've, at times I've thought about um, talking about the yellow fever epidemic and I might come back to it. Richard Allen um, is someone who was prominent in that because what happens in the Philadelphia yellow fever epidemic um, under what in Washington's first term um, is not surprisingly given American history, um, some people flee the city and some people turn to the black community and say, well, you guys, you're immune to yellow fever, so why don't you help us? And the black community, not necessarily immune, they actually step up to help. Um, and so that happens, right? They're basically like, hey, you guys, black people, step in and deal with this. You know, I, I moments in the pandemic that one can think interestingly about the yellow fever epidemic. Afterwards, there's um, a prominent printer in Philadelphia who writes a pamphlet in which he essentially accuses the black people who step forward to help. He, he denies or puts down what they did and even claims some of them stole things from the houses of the people they were helping, which they didn't, right? That's just a lie. And Alan steps forward and writes a pamphlet along with another um, prominent member of the black community in Philadelphia, essentially saying, really, like, really? You know, and he, he really steps forward and defends the black community and talks about that moment and what it means. So he's a public voice who founded a prominent institution um, and was engaged with political argument. Um, you could argue that Again, depending on how you define it, maybe Richard Allen is, is a founder. This says nothing about women, right? If you're talking about eight guys in a room, you know, Abigail Adams is an easy person to say, well, yeah, she was a founder. Mercy Otis Warren, you could say she's a founder. You could, again, you could, those are obvious contenders, but there are probably others that if you think about people who stepped forward and played a major prominent shaping role in a deliberate kind of a way and engaged with the founding and, and the thoughts and events that swirled around it uh, in a leading kind of way, maybe that's how we define founders. I don't know, but I do know that we should not toss around that word sort of without thinking about it. This doesn't mean, you know, because now people are going to be like, you just said founders. I'm not saying we should never use the phrase or never refer to them. I just mean that we should, when we say it, when we use the word founders, we have to be careful how we're using it and acknowledge uh, that they don't all agree. They never all agreed that, that what we're talking about is the sort of general idea during the founding. Maybe that's a better way of saying it. In the founding period, there generally was this kind of view. Um, we could, again, talk about that during the questions after my comments. I'll end in a few minutes. Um, but at any rate, uh, we need to think about what we're saying when we are talking about the founders. If you deny the flawed reality of the founders and the founding, you're basically denying the very things that help explain how we got to where we are today. And I'm not saying there's a direct straight line, which actually people want to say, right? A direct straight line from the founders to the present. Uh, and thus, if I can get a founder to agree with me, it means everything. There isn't a direct straight line like that. But there are roots of things and structures of things and assumptions about things that begin in that period and evolve over time. If you erase them from that period, you're basically erasing evidence to help explain how we got to where we are today. So it's historically irresponsible. It's also something that if you wanna make the past look pretty, 
um, it's a nice, happy, shiny way um, of looking at the present and talking about the shiny moment in the past and denying some of the bad things happening in the present, right? Well, that's not the way America works. America works like that. Like the founders, that's the real America. And all of this other stuff, those are troublemakers. You know, it's a way of defining American history that very carefully trims off anything that is outside of the box of people who really want that box to exist, right? So in all of these ways, um, when we talk about the founders, there can be high stakes. Um, I once had um, a French student in one of my classes, uh, I mean, a stu student from France uh, in one of my classes, in one of my seminars, very early in my time at Yale. Uh, it was, and we, it was, I think the creation of the American politician, might've been the age of Hamilton and Jefferson, whatever it was, partway through the semester, she said, kind of musingly almost to herself, um, you Americans and your founders, like, we don't treat people that way. You know, you like, this is the desk that the founder, you know, she was really sincerely interested in the way that Americans talk about the founders. Um, I won't say that that happens in no other country, but we have a real kind of religion of the founders. And that's what she felt in that class. And it was interesting to, to have someone be in the room and remind us of the distinctive way in which America wrestles with its founders and puts them to political use. So um, again, if you think about being in the future and looking back to the present in the way that we look back to the founding, you realize that it's, it's beyond, I can't even say it's inaccurate. It's like, <laughs> you've got blinders on. You're not seeing what really happened. Oh, my computer keeps doing this, go away. It says updates, like don't update in the middle of my webcast. Um, at any rate, you can see how, if you think about this period being treated in the same way as the founding is treated, how bad that history would be and how in the future, you know, you could claim, well, but in that period, they had these lofty goals and we follow in that tradition, not useful not helpful, not going to explain how you got from point A to point B. Okay, um, I will, I am one minute early. I will stop there. Uh, Tom, Carolee, I don't know if Carolee said mug, mug, mug first, but Tom just did. Um, they they were chanting mug for a few minutes. Pardon? <laughs> they were chanting mug in the chat for a few minutes. Yes, you, you do it really, there's Carolee, really early. I have to like not no. look. We're not ready yet. I know, well, you know, I mean, I got to build up to it. Um, I haven't used this in a long time. I will have to explain the logic behind it. It has a good logic behind it. Okay, so it's from the Hamilton musical. It says one last time. So first of all, it's Hamilton and a founder, but my thinking behind it was, this is not the last time I will be talking about the founders. <laughs> this is not the last time I am going to be trying to get people to think about them in this period in a different kind of a way. So um, I should have put a knot, I should have sketched a knot. Not one last time. Uh, well, there will never be one last time because we will always be wrestling uh, with the founders in this way. I like it. Okay. We can send you one of those sparkly pens, you know? Like <laughs> you know, at some point, but not. <laughs> at some point early um, on in this webcast, I was online looking at mugs with like blackboard material on them and a white pen so yeah. that I could you know and then finally I was like yeah that's that's going a little too far I'm gonna I know I can make my mugs stretch which I have yeah. so okay yeah not one last time I'm gonna open chat again so I can see what folks are saying okay okay the chat has been very uh active this morning but so has the Q&A box so I'm gonna jump mm. right in if that's okay with you so Troy had a question. Uh, Troy wanted to know, how do we tell stories that are engaging and that might persuade people rooted in scholarship that amplify democracy, minimizing all the misinformation? Okay, so let me, let me be clear, sure that I understand that. Are you basically saying, how um, can you teach in the classroom in a he way? Specify that he's a teacher, so I'm not sure if Troy's a teacher. Um, so you have a lot of in here, but he's just asking, like, in general, you, of course, you want them to be engaging and you want them to be rude in scholarship. But given, I think, what he means, everything that's been going on in the world recently, like, how do we amplify democracy and help stop the spread of the misinformation? Uh, okay. Um, well, that, that's a really good question. And in a bunch of ways, one really clear way, well, and one really irritating way, you know, is people who are like, 
We're a republic, not a democracy. Okay. A republic is a democratic form of government. So just stop. <laughs> you know, I mean, the mug right there. <laughs> it is. We're a democratic form of government. We are. And democracy meant something different in the founding than it does today, right? Like so many things in history, no straight lines. So first of all, you go back to the founding and you say, you know what? They talked about democracy in that period. They weren't sure if they liked it, but it was an important thing. And the people st stood up and insisted on it. So democracy was at the very beginning was something that some people realized the value of. Others were threatened because they knew that they couldn't stay in power if the people had more power. You can talk about the fight over democracy in the founding um, and then talk about the ways in which it, it, it took time for it to take root. It was never perfect over the years, but the idea, you know, in a way you could say that one of the fundamental um, contests in the 1790s was a contest over how engaged the American populace should be in American politics, right? In a sense, that's how democratic uh, should the, the politics be. And Federalists really didn't want the public very engaged and Republicans were pretty comfortable with it. And they win, right? They essentially win that debate. The election of 1800 helps confirm that. It's not like poof, we're done. But so I, I guess it's a long way of, it was an early poof. Um, it was a, it's a, long way of saying um, democracy is never settled. Democracy is always being defined. Democracy is always at risk. But the idea underlying democracy, that the public in one way or another is the, the foundation of our government, that goes all the way back, right? No matter how involved the public is on a continual basis, <laughs> the founders, one of the things that that generation assumed that made their government different from monarchies is the degree to which the new American government was going to be grounded on the public will to a different extent. So, um, you know, so, so I think um, making it clear to people that, you know, we are a democracy, we aren't a democracy, that, that's not a useful debate. It goes nowhere um, that actually we need to think about what democracy means and has meant and the fact that that's changed over time. We need to understand that, you know, we had a popular revolution and then we had a government that even it was, if it was highly elitist and even if it trimmed off anyone basically, at least initially, that wasn't a wealthy white man, still, it was a government that was struggling with how democratic that, that, that its politics should be, not democratic in our sense, democratic in their sense. So, so kind of doing uh, what I do for my students in my classes, right? And I think I've said this before. I tell my students that they're not allowed to use democracy speak in their papers. And by democracy speak, I mean liberty, freedom. They wanted freedom and then they fought for liberty and there's no meaning behind those words at all, right? I could do that for a long time. If you're going to talk about those sorts of things, you need to ground them in the reality of things. And I think using the founding and, and American history generally as an example of people of different kinds really stepping forward to claim their voice and to claim their rights. And that that goes back to the, the founding period and that that's still going on today and that there have always been people who step forward to shut people up. And it's important to realize, you know, if you're a citizen you have rights, you have a right to protest, you have a right to voice what you want to voice, right? This is this pretty fundamental fight throughout American history. And in the, the moment that we're in, you know, people who are trying to, elite people who are trying to keep power, um, it's very convenient for them to say, no, we're not a democracy. That's a, that's a statement that has implications that go well beyond the seemingly simple statement that that is. So anyway, that's a meandering kind of answer, but that's what I would offer as part of an answer. When you were talking about people yelling about democracy speak, it made me think of kids that are always saying, I know my constitutional rights. I'm like, clearly you don't. That's why we're <laughs> going in this class because you don't have a constitutional right to wear your pants down but below the waist. But they you know that there, that person knows that there are constitutional yes, rights. Yes, they know there are. They're just not quite yeah. clear on that. That's why they need people like Tara Lee as their teacher. Okay, so Richard's got the next question. He says, do you think the media, in quotes, 
needs to do a better job calling out lies or misuses of history, it seems there is a disinclination to call this out, this type of misinformation. Well, you know, I, I, this will not be a shock to anyone, and I've said this before, but um, a free press is a foundation of any kind of democratic government, and certainly from the beginning was a foundation of ours. Um, you know, there's a reason why newspapers could send news to each other free through the mail. Uh, it was assumed, first of all, in a, in a widespread country in which communication wasn't necessarily easy, newspapers were a way of connecting people. Um, but more than that, newspapers were deemed tools of accountability. How do you hold a government accountable? You watch what they're doing and you report on it. Now, newspapers in that time period were really partisan, really, really, really partisan, right? So it's not as though newspapers were stepping forward and saying, well, since I'm a good reporter, I interviewed this person. You know, interviewing politicians comes along in the 19th century, and even then it can be biased. But the general assumption that a free press is the tool of accountability, that goes all the way back. And what that means is a, a free press means a press that can step forward and evaluate and question and um, expose, you know, that doesn't just report, but actually investigates, not just saying what happens or repeating what happens, but actually stepping forward and explaining and evaluating what happens, right? And I think right now, um, and I'm not gonna go into a long-winded explanation. One could say, certainly a lot of people have said that the Trump administration got people, and, and the, that campaign that led to it got people so um, into the horse race component uh, and the, the extreme you know, views of politics and the craziness that in a sense, the, the press is kind of still in that zone and they're not necessarily stepping forward um, and saying, you know, so this person has this opinion, let's evaluate it. Right, even anyone who's on Twitter and sees people commenting on headlines, some of the headlines in like the New York Times, the Washington Post, and it's important to know people who write those stories, news stories, usually do not have the right to write the headline. So, so don't look at the headline and say that damn reporter. Um, it, it, I don't, anything that I've published, um, sometimes I've had a chance to protest against um, a title I don't like, but the writers don't usually make the, the titles to the articles, but, but some of those titles are so misleading and in a sense, so irresponsible, um, equating things that shouldn't ever be equated. You know, just um, at any rate, I would say that yes, the short answer is yes, the media should be, I think, more assertive in investigating and reporting than it is reporting in a sense of evaluating, not just saying what's happening. And I, I kind of feel like I spend some time rummaging around trying to figure out what really happened because I, I'm not absolutely sure in any single case if I'm getting the full picture. That's true of the hearings true, right? You hear something in the hearings and then you wanna go investigate. Um, the, the press is vital. And, and the only way that we're going to be able to hold any government, any politicians accountable is if we know what they're doing not just in public office, but generally speaking, are they committing crimes? Are they doing things that are unethical? What are they doing and how, what do we need to know? And what does it mean? You know, um, I, I, this is a ridiculous example, but um, when Trump, like probably Trump's first impeachment, um, I kept going on Twitter, um, people kept saying, this is unconstitutional right, that, that um, impeachment is unconstitutional. And I kept saying, yeah, it's in the Constitution. <laughs> and I, I ended up going on MSNBC, um, on, on Brian Williams, I guess the 11th hour, um, because it needed, it, it really needed to be said. And he, he had such a dry wit when he, that was his show. He said to me, sort of very importantly, Professor Freeman, is impeachment constitutional? <laughs> I was like, you know, Brian, it's in the Constitution. <laughs> but that's it's literally that's just, right there. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But but that's a you know a great example of, um, you know, it would have been nice if uh, newspapers had stepped forward and said really blatantly, loudly, you know. Um, so this is what how the process works, as defined in the Constitution. You know, and I'm sure some were, 
but it wasn't loud enough. Uh, so anyway, I don't, and I, I hesitate only because um, I don't want to step forward and sort of slam the press around um, because they're so valuable and they're, they have so much that they're facing right now. And, and every, I'm gonna use my fraught, everything is fraught. Um, we are in a, in a fraught moment. So they deserve credit for the work that they're doing. I don't mean to be like those darn reporters, but I do think this is a, a, a democracy kind of a question, right? I do think evaluating what they're doing and thinking about how it might be done better is valid and important. Okay, so this question comes from Matt Rogers. He says, today the public appears to be caught up in the memory of the founding generation rather than the actual history of the generation. How would you distinguish to the public the difference between the memory of the founding generation versus history of the founding generation? Um, well, I mean, you know, I suppose you might say memories are things that in essence people make. Right. I mean, we observe things and then they become our memories, but they're our memories and we remember them a certain way and we keep them that way and we remember some things and don't remember other things. Memories are constructed. Um, history, you know, again, you can't say it's totally objective, but history means you have to really grapple um, on the ground with facts uh, to at least get a sense of the ground level reality of what's happening. So, so memories are created and, and sometimes, knowingly or not, have an agenda, right? In some way or another, maybe you need to believe something or want to believe something and, and your memories help you get there. So memories, um, kind of like founders, require some thought. Um, memory is, is not unconnected to the sort of fantasy making um, about the past and, and talking about something that didn't really fully ever exist but that you really want to exist in some kind of a way. Um, you know, there's so much work, if you're interested in this question, there's so much work on um, memory and the, the reckoning after the Civil War that if you're interested in, in scholarship on that, there's a lot. Um, David Blight wrote uh, a book, very, you know, prominent book on that. But at any rate, um, it's a good question. Okay, this one comes from Dale, our friend Dale in Williamsburg. He says, given that Adams recognized the flaws in the founders, who would you say was the most flawed founder who also made significant contributions? Wow. Mm, that's a good question. That's a really good question. Um, who would I say? The most flawed founder who made really significant contributions. Uh, so he, I'll, I'll go through my sifting process out loud. Um, so first I thought Aaron Burr and he was as a vice president, he was pretty good vice president, even though he happened to kill Hamilton while he was vice president. Um, but really significant contributions. I'm not sure in the way that this is being asked. Um, Jefferson, you know, really significant contributions other things that are not so good, but is that the most flawed founder? No, his flaws are, there are a lot of people with some of those flaws. Um, I, I'm going to say something that I'm going to regret saying, um, but I'm gonna say it anyway. One could nominate Hamilton because uh, he had a huge impact, huge impact, right? On structuring the government, on structuring the treasury department, on, in any number of ways, but, he was really self-destructive. He was extreme in his politics, like really extreme, pushing things into a way that they shouldn't go. Um, he, he did some damage and, and helped push extremists to be more extreme. So he definitely had a huge impact. Is he the worst or the most flawed? No, but he's, you know, when I got interested in him, it was his flaws that interested me. It was like, well, he's a founder and he did all these things, but look at him, right? You know, he gets involved in 10 affairs of honor. Um, he, you know, people thought he was a monarchist. Like, what did he do to, to justify that? And that people, you know, that haunted him his entire political career. Like, who is this guy? He always said what he wasn't supposed to say. He always, you know, did what people asked him not to do. Who, who is this guy? So I don't, he's not the worst, but um, his flaws are pretty significant. I will say so that, that he, he wasn't, actually Jefferson says, um, he wasn't corrupt. 
Um, he was, how does Jefferson put it? Cor um, corrupted by the British example, but not like personally corrupt, not stealing money or. Yeah. Well, Julia's question follows up perfectly then. It says, how much has popular culture affected the move of Hamilton into the founders group? Whew. <laughs> That's a question. So um, Hamilton musical and, and Chernow's biography, um, it was a sea change. And, and I, I'm not kidding when I say that if I went back into the depths of my computer into old files of the lectures I gave, a lot of them started with what I mentioned before, um, that there's a room with all the, you know, the founders in it and Hamilton's banging at the door because he's just not included. People didn't know who he was. If they knew, all they knew was that he's on the $10 bill and he died in a duel. Um, he just wasn't significant. He just, or he was the bad guy. You know, Jefferson was a good guy and Hamilton just that other guy who did bad things. He just, you know, a lot of what I was doing as a public minded historian, and even before I was formally a historian, was talking about why he needs to be incorporated into the larger story. So he he really was off the radar screen. I mean, and people the, over some over the years when I've talked to people and I've asserted that more than one person has said, "Really? It's like really? <laughs> like we're in a different we're on a different planet as far as Hamilton is concerned. Really?" Um, so you know, Chernow's book came along, and uh, it's you know one of those. Father's Day books, you know, big biography. Um, and it created a hero, Hamilton. Um, you know, it it was a more positive about Hamilton than I might be. Um, you know, it said some things that I, I might be harsher about. Uh, it, it gave him credit for some things that actually were just sort of generally happening at the time, right? Like, if you're studying one person in a time period, and you don't think about or you don't know the world that surrounds that person, you give that person credit for things that actually are part of the time period. You know, so this is like when people say like, what do you get as a historian? One thing you get as a historian is you, you try to get a grasp of a time period so that when you're looking at a person in it, you can actually tell what they're doing that's distinctive or just of the period. So anyway, I think that the Hamilton biography to me is kind of makes him a hero which I have to tell you, my jaw dropped, right? I was like, really? <laughs> He's a hero? And, and, and people, you know, went in that direction. I thought that was kind of fascinating. I didn't quite know what to make of it, given that I wasn't absolutely sure I agreed with its take. And then the Hamilton musical took that and ran with it and did it brilliantly, right? And in, in a way that unlike anything I've seen before, even unlike the movie um, musical 1776, made the founding accessible uh, and human in a way that I think for many people it had never, never been before. So suddenly people are connecting with the founding in a different way so that all of that happening within the same few years, that, that had a huge impact. So that my career began with me saying, you know, Hamilton's important, you need to know about him. And at this point I say, he's not so great. <laughs> And that represents my career. <laughs> I'm, that's it, pretty much. Well, and I'm, I'm, I'm writing, uh, I'm trying to write, um, I'm writing something about um, actually how we wrestle with history. Hamilton's going to be kind of a, an example at the center of it. And there will be a chapter on this, um, mm. of, of just watching the transformation over the course of my career of how, where Hamilton came from and where he went in the public mind and what that says about America. Yeah. It, if you had told us 10 years ago that every middle school girl would be singing about Alexander Hamilton, we would have thought you were nuts. Well, right. I mean, so this is the thing. It's like, there's so many when, I, when I've done public, particularly when the musical is really new and, and kids really sort of took to it. You know, I would give public talks and parents would bring their kids over, right? Who are like really excited because there's a person who knows about Hamilton. You know, right. It was, it was, yeah. it, or another mother that was like, my kid now knows about the French Revolution. <laughs> my little kid. Like they know. They're they know the French. Right. Exactly. You know, so so um there are some things you could say um people learn from the musical that aren't necessarily historically accurate. It is a musical. It is not straight history. Um, mm -hmm. 
and you could have an argument about that, right? That um, on the one hand, it's offering a distorted view of history. And so that's irresponsible and bad. And, and some historians believe that. I fully acknowledge it, it has things in it that leaves things out. It has things in it that are um, inaccurate or wrong, or it, it condenses things in all kinds of ways. Um, you know, slavery gets mentioned once, I think, um, maybe twice. Uh, all of these things are big problems, but the degree to which it got people interested in the time period so that you can teach even against it, right? You love Hamilton. Let's talk about what really happened. That, that's huge. Speaking as someone who has been teaching about the founding for a very long time, the fact that I have a founding course, you know, and, and for a while, they were like sitting on the floor, standing in the hallway, right? We're going to learn about the founding. That, 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 that's valuable. Uh, that's valuable. It gets people to think about history as human. It gets people, you can encourage people to ask questions, to realize there's not one way in which you have to understand everything. So. Yeah, I think I think the Edgeham, the Gilder Lehrman has that Edgeham curriculum that that Lynn Manuel right. gave them permission and actually supported. And they've gone into thousands probably by now of schools. Yeah. They came to, to our high school and it, it was amazing because they did that. Then the kids really dug into the real history. So it got the kids to where we needed them without us yeah. having to say, memorize this because it's on the test, you know, which we all hate yeah. to say. Okay, yeah. so Lauren has a great question. He says, since the passing of time often confers gravitas and veracity to some people and their opinions, like the founders, uh, it destroys the reputation of others. How do we discern who might be worthy of following in our own time? And then who do we respect now in high regard that maybe history didn't treat them that way? So who in our own time do I think like how do we might... figure out who the good guys are now? And then how do we look at that in history? Um, I mean, I would say a, a short partial answer is um, doing a version of what I said we need to do with the founders. Um, what are they saying? What are they doing? Uh, are those the same things? You know, getting a sense of do people stand for something? Are they standing up for these things? Are they consistent in standing up for these things? Do they seem to be opportunists um, who really don't stand for anything? Um, I think that's part of it, right? I mean, we can look at this moment and see people who are silent at a moment when they shouldn't be, for example. Um, maybe there are other ways in which those people will be important, but off the cuff, I would say those are not people who are showing themselves to be great people of this time. Given everything that's happening around us, if you're a person of power and you're not saying anything about a lot of what you're seeing, uh, things that you know are untrue, things that you know are wrong, you know, how often have we read in newspapers, you know, well, privately, they say this is clearly wrong. It's like, well, that's nice. You're, you're being silent. Um, those are people I would not step forward to praise. Um, but I do think it has to do with seeing what people say and what they do, what they really do, um, and getting a sense of their backbone. Um, there are all kinds of ways to be a good guy. Uh, that's one way, you know, and it's not just people with power who get to be the good guys. But I think that's, that's one way to at least begin to judge, to discern or think about people with power in different ways. A lot of people are putting Liz Cheney in the chat that they think she'll be remembered in history where she's getting vilified by some now that in well, time. She's a good example in that, and even now it's difficult for people because you know I don't agree with her politics at all. Um, but I really appreciate that she's standing up there and doing what has to be done. So you're absolutely right that she, but so here will be an interesting thing, right? Let's say if we're alive, a million bazillion, you know, however, however much the youngest of us, however much into the future we can go, the question will be, is she remembered as a person of these politics who even so stood up and did this against her political views, or is she just remembered as the brave hero who stood up and, right? Because there's an example and people are already doing it now. She's a hero. It's like, well, a hero I have a problem with. She's, she, I absolutely am beyond grateful for what she's doing. Um, but she's a hero, like that sort of blesses her with a, a sort of 
shield of goodness. Um, and as an entire person, I don't think she's entirely a hero. I don't, I don't, like I said, I don't, she has very strong political views, which she's entitled to, and many people agree with her. I don't. Um, so I wouldn't say she's a hero necessarily for being a politician. That's what she is entitled to do. It is her, what she is doing is heroic. Um, it's pretty pathetic that very few others uh, on the right uh, are willing to do that. Those are the silent people. Um, but I think we're in a moment where we keep looking for heroes, and giving people heroic status. And I don't, I think that's dangerous because I think, you know, just like, um, Mueller, uh, Mueller and the report, um, you know, we, we keep sort of working our way through people, you know, and he'll save us, he'll save us, he'll save us. And then of course they can't. And then we're like, you know, I, I think um, there will be people who will be remembered for doing good and important things. Cheney will be remembered for that. All right, so this question comes from Jennifer. She says, some people are calling for a new constitutional convention. Now she says, if God forbid that happens, do you think we would end up developing something more like going back more towards something like the Articles of Confederation? And she asks, why do Southern states always seem to gravitate towards confederations despite <laughs> history showing time and time again, both here and abroad that they fail? Well, the, I'll do the second one first. Um, why confederations or governments that have a, a less strong national presence? Because if you're going to assert claims that don't necessarily have the majority behind them, much easier to do on a local level or on a state level, right? If you have control of local politics, of state politics, if you get control of the legislature, if you have judges of your politics in power, on a local level, you can do all kinds of things that on a national level, you might not be able to because you never have quite that amount of power. So, you know, part of the answer, I mean, this goes all the way back, right? So um, in antebellum America, um, a confederacy, you know, people resorting to states, right? States' rights, states' rights. States in states, these people had power, they could change what happened, they could protect certain things from happening, and that felt good, right? On a national level, there are all kinds of weird threats, and they, you know, to slaveholders, and they felt to slaveholders, that they were un-American in some ways. Um, that's, you know, secession is partly, well, we're gonna go back to the place where we have control. So I think if you are um, not even necessarily a party, if you are part of a group that kind of knows that in democratic political worlds, um, you might not get what you want because you aren't with the majority, you will want to operate on a local or state level because it will be easy, easier to get your way. So I think that's part of the answer. I forgot the, the first half of that question. I was so busy jumping into the second half. Um, I think I think you I think you got it in there. Okay. 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 So we have uh, a couple more. We're in the home stretch here. Uh, Ellen asks, when you're thinking of this idea of founders, uh, as it applies to more recent political actions, what extent do you think someone should look at local politics instead of at the national, like local founders? I, you know, I think that's important. I, I taught um, with my colleague, um, Joanne Meyerowitz. So it was the double Joanne class. Um, we taught a course on public history and um, the students all had to do their own public history projects. Uh, and there was one project that its underlying argument was, what if we um, talk about larger messages, larger um, important things to understand, but we do it on a local level for, for school kids, because they'll be able to see and, and understand things that are around them in a way that will have an impact and can include different kinds of peoples than you know, just a big broad national history. So the, the project was, was local history can be really useful and effective and we don't often use it to teach with, but uh, kind of in the, along the lines of what I just said, right? If you're doing something on a local level, you can have a bigger reach. I'm not saying it should replace anything bigger, but I, I think that that can be a really useful teaching tool. You know, I mean, I remember, um, gosh, so I would have been like in fourth grade, maybe fifth grade, maybe third grade, one of those grades. I was in the same school for all of them. Um, there was a house 
uh, this is Yorktown Heights. And there was a house in Yorktown Heights that had been involved in some kind of battle or gunplay. And you could see the evidence of it still on the house. There was like a, a hole or a something, which I still remember, right? From when I was like in third or fourth grade, because I it, it was a house and I drove past it. You know, my parents took me past it when we went to the farmer's market and, but it was real, right? There was something real there. So um, I think there can be a real power. Uh, in a way, that's a great way of stepping away from myths is bringing it down to a local level. People aren't starting with, you know, views, they're, they're more open to the fact that people are people and these people, you know, they lived right where you lived. That's, that's like the, the battle um, of New Haven. Have I, I've talked about that here, right? I think I have I think, yeah. the same thing, right? That, that in my revolution course, when I have a lecture, that's just about the battle of New Haven. And I point out the streets where things happened. It's not that my students didn't understand the revolution otherwise, but it becomes <laughs> grippingly real if you're talking about what's happening around you and you're not talking about highfalutin power holders, but just the people who lived in New Haven. Yeah. So our final question, if you're willing to take one more, because you, you kind of fell one. right into this question because you said the word myth. Cece asked, um, in the last few years, it, she feels like in her teaching, all she's doing, she's spending literally like the first part of the course just myth busting all the myths, you know, the damage of, of these myths in history. She she asked to what extent the political system today is kind of, it, it's gone kind of viral with this all these myths. And so are there any strategies to, to stop spreading these so that it's, it just seems to be getting worse, she says. Yeah, no, I'm sure it is because it's not, there have always been myths and particularly about early America and the founding period. Um, but now we see strategic mythifying, right? Strategic mm, like politically, yes, strategic politically directed mythifying. Um, and that that has a power to it. And that's different from sort of general mythology. Um, you know, what I assume, so I'm talking about, you know, all four years of college, uh, I assume when I start a semester, particularly like a big lecture course on the revolution, so there are people coming from all over the place with all different understandings of history. Um, I assume they come in with Paul Revere and, you know, um, a, a very small collection of sort of myth mythological understandings of things or of, you know, America was great, you know, and unable to sort of get beneath the surface to see what really happened. I confront that the first class. First of all, I tell my teaching assistants, um, they're gonna be fighting the, the, the myths of the founding era for the entire semester. So watch for it and then complicate it. But I, my first lecture course, I think this is probably true for the, one, for the online version. Uh, the first lecture in, in my revolution lecture course is, you know, there are a lot of myths. <laughs> And you guys are all sitting here and I know some of the myths you've got and you're not going to have them at the end of the semester. You know, so I just lay it right out there that we tell ourselves stories about this time period. And here we're going to actually try and talk about what really happened. And some of your myths are going to be, you know, the balloon is going to be burst and that will be good. But it takes sometimes weeks and weeks and weeks. People are still democracy speaking you know, uh, unable to step away from that sort of shiny view of the founding. It takes a while. Um, the, it's, a pa it's powerful to have a heroic, shiny past that you can cling to and that you can say, look, we are so great that we are shiny, beautiful, and perfect from the beginning. You know, it, it's less, it do, it's not quite as strident to say, we were founded on some really important principles that weren't entirely met at the time, but that matter. So let's look at how they weren't met and how they were and how people have used those ideals to fight for their rights over time, right? That's that's harder. You have to find a different way to be strident about that. <laughs> I always resort to, you can't understand where we are unless you understand where we've been. Um, but at any rate. So two things, we're forming an all-girl band called Strategic Mythifying. <laughs> Lead guitar, lead guitar is still available. Okay. Uh, I'm on drums. Carolee will be the lead singer. Uh, and the other thing is when you were talking about that, that I think what you said about you spend the, the myth, you know, myth busting in your college courses, 
we're trying so hard to get us to stop teaching that nonsense in elementary and middle even yeah, yeah. you know stop sugarcoating it and yet we've seen the result like in the last few years we've trying to teach the truth to kids we're trying to kind of break it to them gently in the younger years not the whole cherry tree george washington story or paul revere but right. It's getting a lot of pushback have we seen so yeah no, we are literally true. out of questions we've never done this before well, so we, I think we're over we're, we're seven over. minutes over so you it. know we went Thank long you. um let me do what i must do uh, at this moment uh and that is um first of all uh to thank you all for coming here on a friday morning um and for engaging in democracy uh this is important it's always important, however big or small the group is, if you're here and you're questioning and examining and talking about what's going on and how it connects to the past, you are doing important work. And when you do it in a community, you are sharing with others the fact that it matters. It's not just you. There are other people who agree with you. It's an idea that matters. And there are others who you can join with to take action. So thank you for engaging in democracy. Um, I, I will say, actually, in the um, live podcast episode I did last night, uh, at the end of the episode, when I said goodbye, I held up the thank you for engaging in democracy on a Friday morning mug, right? Because I, I was trying to say thank you for engaging in democracy. So so history matters had a little appearance. Um, if right now we're going to segue to the after party, what that means is we stop recording uh, we leave Facebook and it's a more informal conversation, which can wander wherever you want it to wander. If you beamed in uh, online without Facebook, just stay right here and poof, you will be in the after party. If you are watching on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook to join the after party. You need to come to ncheteach.org slash conversations, and that will put you poof. Uh, into the after party. So thanks to everyone. Um, I will see you in a week with some other topic that I will think of uh, hopefully before Thursday. Uh, and have a have a good week. And for the group that is did this at Monticello, have a wonderful visit. Yeah. So I don't know, John, uh, are you still with us? <laughs> I'm wondering, John, I when I signed in, I signed in as Monticello on their computer that's hooked up to the big